Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God above, who's here below. Praise God above, ye heavenly host. Praise Amen. Please be seated. Today we begin a new sermon series on the parables of Jesus. And the sermon series may last us all the way to Easter. I'm not really sure of the timing of some things coming up, but we plan on it lasting all the way to Easter. And so before I jump in on our parable for the day, I just want to talk about parables a little bit and how Jesus used them. First of all, I'm wondering if anybody has a concise definition. Uh, if you've been in the church, you hear the word parable and you go, oh yeah, of course, I know exactly what a parable is. But does anybody have a concise definition of a parable that you would share with us? You're all like, oh, 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 oh. here we go. It's funny, that's going to come into play and just in, in actually in our text. But it is this, an earthly story and by that I mean something that everybody can relate to and everybody knows, an earthly story with very much a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And Jesus often used parables to teach. Parables are stories. He used them to teach. And sometimes people thought Jesus used them just as moral teaching. But Jesus didn't just use the parables as moral teaching. No, there's, they're very much theological teaching as well. And when it comes to Jesus and parables, we have to understand he's telling an earthly story. He's telling it in first century Palestine, first century Middle East. And so he's using words and phrases and understandings that everybody there would have understood and so he doesn't explain some aspects of what he's talking about because he doesn't need to because everybody around him understands. For example, it would be like if I would say to you, began a story and said, oh, after church, I have to go to the airport and fly down to California. I don't have to explain to you that I'm going to take 18 out to 205 over the bridge and then park at the airport. To I don't have to explain that to you, right? Because you know that inherently. Well, there are things that people inherently know as Jesus is teaching the parables that everybody around him gets, but that we don't get because we're 21st century people. So we have to keep that in mind with the parables. The other aspect of the parables that we have to keep in mind is this about Jesus. Jesus was not only fully human, fully divine, fully God, and he died for us on the cross. We tend to focus on that. But because Jesus was fully divine, Jesus is also the most intelligent person that has ever lived, right? Because he's fully divine. And so his stories are crafted that way. Sometimes, oh, he's just a simple storyteller, a miracle worker. No, he's very intelligent and very wise in what he's doing. He's bringing in all these aspects. And so we have to keep that in mind about Jesus. He doesn't waste many words. And a lot of his words have a lot of meaning behind them. And we'll see that as we go through the parables. And I invite you now to take out the Bibles which you brought with you. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. The parable is actually only found in 48 and 49, but we're going to cover the two verses ahead of it. So I invite you to take out your Bibles, whether you're at home or whether you're here. And for, for this sermon series, I really ask you to bring your Bibles or some type of Bible on your own, because I think you're going to find out that there's a lot more going on in all of these parables than we necessarily understood at a, different, at a different point. So take out the Bibles. You can take out your phone. I usually read my own personal devotions on the phone. There are Bibles in front of you and the chairs in front of you. You can take out one of those. If you like that Bible better than your own, please take it with you. It's our gift. Or if you know somebody who needs a Bible, please take that Bible and give it to them. We want God to have, or we want people to have the word of God in their lives, in their hearts. And of course, it's on the screen, and I almost never do this, but today I am going to read the scriptures off the screen itself. Jesus begins in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He says this, 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete or total. Will you join with me in prayer? Almighty and gracious God, I thank you for the words of Jesus and how they were meaningful to people in the first century and how they are still very meaningful to us today. Lord God, I pray that you would come and be the teacher and the preacher this morning. I pray, Lord, that there would be more of you and less of me in these words I'm about to speak. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a child growing up, my favorite morning of the week was always Saturday morning. Not, because I only, not only because I didn't have a school, and not only because that was the morning in which the three television channels, some of you may remember a time when there was only three TV channels, uh, you know, I, that was ancient, ancient history. Everybody, you know, barely anybody had a car when that happened, anything like that. It was very bad. But they had cartoons on Saturday morning, right? But that's not why it was my favorite day of the week. It was my favorite day of the week because it was the first day of the week that I really ever saw my dad in the morning. Otherwise, he got up much earlier, drove into the city of San Francisco. We never saw him in the morning. But then Saturday morning, I woke up, there was my dad. And he was usually downstairs, and he was making pancakes for my brother and my sister and I. It was kind of a ritual that we did. I didn't realize that this was a ritual that other people did as well, because I read a story not long ago about a woman, her name was Karen, and her two sons, Kevin, who was seven, and Ryan, who was five. It was Saturday morning, and she was making them pancakes. And what often happens when you have siblings, you know, even if there's going to be enough pancakes for everyone, right, somebody wants the first pancake. And so on this day, Kevin and Ryan were, I want the first pancake, I want the first pancake. Karen thought this, their mother thought this was a wonderful teaching opportunity. And so she said to them, you know, boys, if Jesus were here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin turned to his brother, Ryan, and said, Ryan, have I got a deal for you? You can be Jesus. I don't think Kevin quite caught the message that mom was trying to teach or that Jesus may have been trying to teach. I use that story, though, for two reasons. First of all, it is a kid's story, story about kids. And I want to contrast that with today's parable. Because some people, more than any other parable, think the parable this morning is like a kid's story. Because we made a kid's song out of it, right? Don't build your house on a sandy land. Don't build too near the shore. Oh, you have to build it twice and then build it twice. Whatever. I don't know all the words anymore. But we've been made a song out of it. So sometimes we think it's a children's parable. It is not a children's parable. The second reason is because Kevin clearly didn't quite get the message of Jesus that mom was trying to convey in her little story. But in the same way, in this text, it's clear that the people that Jesus is talking to also did not get his message or his lessons. And we see this very clearly in verse 46 as Jesus starts out, right? He asked a very tough and pointed question. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? which means leader, it could mean teacher, it could mean master, someone you look up to. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Now we assume that the people around Jesus at this point knew enough to call him Lord, but they were not living it out. And so Jesus gives us, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? 
And now there's, we, we never know in the scripture sometimes if there's a break in timing or not, but I have to assume here, and sometimes we just keep on reading scripture like there's no break at all. But I have to assume here that Jesus took one of those breaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Hmm? And maybe the crowd did the same thing when I said, hey, what's a short definition of a parable? What did you all do? I'm going to look at my, oh, look at my, look at my shoes. Oh, these are really good. Oh, don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact with the guy. Or you're in class and a professor has asked that question. You're like, somebody else answer the question, please. Somebody else answer the question. Has anybody else ever been there in their life? I have been. Sure. You know, and so Jesus asks this question and waits. And it's like, awkward. Oh. Now, if it were me, I'd wait until you all broke out into a cold sweat because I'm not very nice. But Jesus is merciful. And so he eventually continues on and describes what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. Basically answers the question. He says, now for, as for everyone, and again, we have to stop right here. I told you Jesus was very smart. And the way that he constructed it in the Greek, and we read it even in the English, when he says, as for everyone, what is he implying? Not everyone. See the point he makes without even making the point? It's brilliant. And Jesus is saying, as for everyone, opens it up for everyone, right? Everyone is, but at the same time, he's very much saying, not everyone is doing this. It's very, it's brilliant. So Jesus says, as for everyone... And then he goes on to describe what a disciple looks like or the path to discipleship. He says, as for everyone who, and there's three parts to discipleship. You come to Jesus, come into a relationship with God, or you come on Sunday morning, or you come to a Bible study, whatever. You come to Jesus. You hear the word. There's various ways to hear the word. You can read it. You can do a devotion, read a sermon, watch something on YouTube nowadays. There's so many ways, but you come to Jesus, you hear the word, and then you have to put it into practice. That is discipleship. That is being a follower of Jesus. Coming, hearing, and doing. And when we put it that way, it seems kind of straightforward, right? It seems almost simple. You just come, you hear, and you do. But it's not as easy as what it appears to be in the scripture. And for me, it's kind of like, not quite yet, it's kind of it's kind of like what, uh, what I've heard putting like Ikea furniture is like together. I personally have never been to Ikea. I know it's right down by the airport. I've never purchased anything from Ikea, but I've had friends who have purchased things from Ikea and they go to the store, they see the furniture, especially when we were younger, didn't have as much money. And they go, oh, this piece of furniture. It looks like it's pretty good quality. It's not all that much. It fits in my budget. Sure, I'll get this piece of Ikea furniture. But they get it, and then they bring it home, and they pull out the instructions, and then it looks like this. Uh, what is going on? I heard this story over and over and over again from people who, my friends who have bought Ikea furniture. They're like, putting it together is almost impossible. And then they say, well, we finally think we have put it together. But we have all this other stuff left over. And now, you know, when you put furniture together, sometimes you, they may include an extra screw or something else in there just in case you lose one. But my friends tell me, like, they have way more stuff left over than they should. But they're like, uh, we think we're finished. So Ikea furniture seems pretty straightforward. But it's not as straightforward as it looks like in the factory. And this scripture text in verse 47 is not as straightforward as it looks. The reason it's not as straightforward and as simple, it's all about the verbs. All about the verbs. I, I want to say something else there. I'm, I'm making myself laugh in my own head. I apologize. But it's all about, it's all about the verbs. <laughs> and the reason it's all about the verbs. <laughs> Sorry. I just, the child of growing up, growing up at a certain age. I, I was going to say it's all about the base, but some of you may not even understand. That. Some of you will get that. Some of you will not get that. So I, that's why I was like, that's not funny. It's only funny to me. And it would only cause my wife to roll her eyes at me. And, you know, but it's all about, no, it's all about the verbs. Thank you for laughing at my silly jokes. 
It's all about the verbs because here the verbs are all in the, you know, it's written in the Greek originally. The Greek language is in the present participle. And what that means is that this is a continual action that is implied. It is not something that you do once. You're like, everyone who comes to me, oh, I came on Sunday morning. Whew, I am good. I came one time this month. Fantastic, safe. No, that doesn't what it means. Or hears him once. I heard one sermon one time. You know, it's kind of happened to me at a wedding or a funeral, but you know, I'm good. And puts them into practice. No, what it means is that we are called to continually come to Jesus. Continually hear the word. Continually put them into practice. And then it becomes not so straightforward, right? Then it becomes a little more difficult. Especially when we take into account where this parable transpires in the scripture. Now, when Jesus says, whoever comes to me and hears my words, he, in general, yes, he means all words. But we also have to keep in mind where this parable is. This parable actually occurs twice in the scriptures. Once here in Luke. And in Luke, it is at the end of something which we call the Sermon on the Plain. The, the longest sermon that Jesus gives in the Gospel of Luke. So it's at the end of the Sermon on the Plain. The other place this parable occurs is at the end of Matthew chapter 7. And from Matthew 5 through 7 is something known as the Sermon on the... Anybody? Mount. Oh, that was an easy enough one. No one looked at their, no one looked at their shoes on that one. Yeah. At the Sermon on the Mount. So when Jesus is talking about hearing my words he's ta- and putting them into practice, he's talking about what he just spoke on the Sermon on the Plain and the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, don't hide your faith under a bushel. Stand up and talk about your faith. Huh. It's also in the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, where he says, love your enemies. Hmm. He says, pray for those who persecute you. If someone... Slaps you on the cheek. What are you supposed to do? Turn and offer them the other one. Continually. He also says in these words, don't have anxiety. Don't worry. Trust in him completely. Do any of us do all of those things continually? I I don't have to confess. And so that's why I say this is not as straightforward and as easy, but it is the best for us. When we try to follow Jesus all the time, continually, try to do the right thing all the time, it serves for a better life for us. And if we don't do it, we miss out on so much. I believe this is wonderfully illustrated in this story I heard about this carpenter who had worked for a contractor for many years. This carpenter was mostly a finished carpenter, but he had a lot of skills when it, come, when it came to building his house. And so this contractor who he worked for for a long time had him do additional things besides just carpentry. He had him do a bunch of different things because he was so skilled and because he did everything so well. He was a man known, maybe it took a little bit more time doing it, but whatever he did, he did right. You know, it was going to be done well and it was done very well. Well, this carpenter finally, he was working in this house and he was getting tired and he just decided that it was time between he and his wife that he retired and he kind of was done. He just came to an end, knew it was time. And so he told the contractor, he said, you know, I'm sorry, you've been very faithful to me for so many years. I've enjoyed working with you, but I, I've got to retire. And the contractor, of course, of course, was disappointed, but he said to him, I understand, but can you do me this favor? Can you, can you build me just one more house? Can you work on me with this one more house? You've just such good craftsmanship. I know you're a hard worker. Would you just do one more house? And the carpenter really wanted to retire, but the contractor really, quite frankly, was insistent and said, no, no, please, please. And so finally the carpenter, he didn't really want to, but he's like, okay, fine. I will build you one more house. And because he knew he was a good carpenter and could do many other aspects of the house building, the contractor had him build a lot, large part of this house. Again, because he knew he was good. He took his time. He did things right. But as the carpenter was going through this house, he's like, I don't really want to be building this house. I told him I wanted to retire. And so what did he do? He started short cutting some things and not doing it to his usual standard, not, not caring as much as he usually did because he was tired and he just didn't want to finish everything out. And so at the end, when he said he was finished, the contractor came to look at the house and they inspected it and they came out and they stood on the front porch and the contractor said, thank you so much. And as your reward for working for me for so long, here are the keys to this house. It's yours. 
But what happened, he had shortcut, and he knew it. He didn't do it continually, all the time, even to the end. And the first point I want to draw out for all of us is that following Jesus is a 24-7 commitment. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have to always do it. And to drive this point home, then Jesus gets into the parable in verse 48. And in verse 48, he says, they are like a man, person, they are like a man building a house. Now, this is a common activity for us in the first century. It's a common activity up until this century. Uh, who, who here has ever built a house? Okay. And I don't know if that means like having somebody else build it. Building a house is not an easy job, right? Not an easy project. However, I will say this. Building a house in 20th or 21st century America in the Western world is relatively easy. Now you're like, wait, what do you mean relatively easy? It can be forever. This is what I mean by relatively easy. For the most part, somebody is coming, or maybe you are, renting a backhoe and digging it out, right? Then the cement truck is coming and pouring the foundation. You're not doing that by hand, are you? No, when you need materials, they're mostly all supplied and brought to your building site, right? If you're building a bigger building or a bigger house, the trusses are made somewhere in a factory and then they're shipped to your house and they're usually put up. Okay, all of that can be hard, but in the 21st century, it's relatively easy to build a house, especially when compared with first century Palestine. Because when Jesus talks about building a house here, everybody around him knows what that means, that we don't. This is what it means. Number one, they only built in the summer. Okay, they did not build in the winter. They couldn't do it. They just couldn't keep water out and all that stuff. So they only built in the summer. Not like over here, our, our new neighbors that were trying to bless and prayer walk for and invite over. They built all the way through the winter, right? They just kind of build all the time. Mm -mm, only build during the summer. They also know that the soil in Palestine at that time, very, very high clay content. And so if you have soil with a very high clay content and you're building only in the summer and it's baking in the summer, what does that mean that ground is like? Hard or concrete. And in fact, the Bible in Leviticus 26, 19 talks about the ground in the round Jerusalem area in this whole area. It's like bronze. Okay, that's what it's like. So this was likened to. And you're not doing anything with any power tools. There's no backhoe coming to dig this out. You're digging with kind of a rudimentary pick. And in order, they all knew this, in order to build a safe house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock, there's rock all around that area. Here's the trouble though. The rock could be one inch below that soil or it could be 10 feet down. And you've got to dig down deep by hand with a pick or whatever else they had in order to get, to, or, need, or even to start your house, right? That's what you have to do. And so the second point I want to make is that following Jesus can be hard work. Not all the time. But following Jesus can be hard work. I want to point that out because I've been to many churches where they just say, oh, just follow Jesus and your life is going to be happy, happy all the time. Everything's going to be great and it's not really hard. And Jesus, oh, it's, it's just super easy to follow Jesus. It's so great because he loves you. Well, at times, yes. But at times, following Jesus is hard work. I read an article actually just this morning. I was scanning through some websites and there's a Christian article and a guy was talking about how just wonderful and easy it is to follow God because he loves us all the time. Yes, God loves us all the time. It's not always easy to follow Jesus. It's not always easy to turn the other cheek, right? It's not always easy to talk about our faith. It's not always easy to have patience with a person who has 25 items in the grocery store in the 15 item lane, you know? It's my own struggle. I'm sorry to share that with you all. But we all have those little struggles, don't we? It's not always easy to follow Jesus. And it takes a lot more to put our money where our mouth is, basically, and live truly by faith. Because it's one thing to say, to hear, or to come to Jesus and to hear, but then we have to put it into practice, right? Putting into practice is a little harder as somebody known as the Great Blondin found out in 1859. Maybe some of you know the name, the Great Blondin. 
but he came from the Blondin family. These guys were tightrope walkers. And so this guy wanted to make a big splash. And in June of 1859, he's, he made a tightrope over from Niagara Falls, from the Canadian side to the American side. And he walked over, you know, first with one of those poles that they used to keep balance. Then he came back. Then he walked over without the pole and came back. And he did this several times over several days. And one time he got out there and he had a wheelbarrow. Took a wheelbarrow over to one side, came back. And he asked the people, who thinks I can do this again? Ah, oh, everybody, yeah, everybody. He went to the other side, came on back. He said, who thinks I can do it a third time? Oh yeah, you can do it a third time. And then he asked, who's willing to get in the wheelbarrow with me? <laughs> Coming to Jesus, hearing those words, putting them into practice. It's like getting in the wheelbarrow, people. That's what it means. Are we going to get in the wheelbarrow? With Jesus? Or are we going to be like the other guy in verse 49? And verse 49 says, But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Was complete. He didn't want to dig down to the foundation. Why? Because it was a hard work. He wanted to get this done. I mean, if you're building a house like that, you're most likely not building a house in one summer time. It may take you two to three summers to actually build your house and get it complete. But this person didn't want to do it. He felt that he felt the rock, you know, not the rock, but he felt the soil, high clay content. Oh, that's good. I can build a house on this. No problem. But what was he? He was short-sighted. He didn't have long-term vision. And so following Jesus, also another point I want to bring out, following Jesus takes some long-term vision or what I might also call eternal perspective and not just living in the short term, but the long term. And that's for our lives as well. Because I can tell you, I've been, a, I've been ordained now as a pastor for coming up on 30 years. I know I don't look that old. Thank you for telling me that. Um, but almost, at, and I will tell you, the most amount of people I've ever had in my office most of the issues are people who have made decisions based on short-term thinking or short-term rewards and not really heavenly thinking or long-term vision. And following Jesus, I think, requires that eternal perspective. A couple other points I want to make before we leave this parable. And one I'm sure you've already picked up on. Number one, the storm comes for us all. Did you pick that up in the parable? Didn't matter whether you're building your house on the foundation or not the foundation. The storm, the flood comes for us all. And I think it would be great if in your own life, you have not had that happen to you yet. But my guess is for most of us sitting here, we have had it happen one way or another. Maybe it's our health has gone bad. Maybe a relationship has gone bad. Maybe we made a poor financial choice. Maybe somebody did something to us, quite frankly. It wasn't even something we did. But that storm and that flood, it comes for us all at some point. And here's the last point, but it's going to take us a little bit to get through. <laughs> it's that Jesus needs to be our foundation or our cornerstone as we build our life in him. And I told you before that Jesus is being very smart, very intelligent, and he's making a very theological point here, which we often don't think about. It's based on this foundation and cornerstone, and it's based off of a fact that this parable is not the first time it's kind of appeared in the scripture. In fact, this parable has appeared in a different way in the book of Isaiah, Chapter 28, verses 14 through 18. And remember, Jesus, the people Jesus are talking to, they knew their Bibles, which was the Hebrew Bible, much better generally than we know our Bibles. So they would have known what Jesus was saying. Let me read through this and I will go through it very quickly. This is the prophet Isaiah saying, Therefore, hear the, Lord, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. So it's the kingdom of Jerusalem. This takes place right around 705 BC. You boast... We have entered into a covenant or an agreement with death. You can put in there Egypt. 
okay? Because Egypt had a fascination with death. That's who he's talking about. With the realm of the dead, again, they all have that. We have made an agreement, basically a mutual compact that you're gonna come to our defense. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, that's the Assyrian army. If you remember from the book of Jonah, maybe back we went through that sermon series, how bad the Assyrians were. I mean, they were bad people. So that's the scourge he's talking about. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us, they think, because they've made a covenant with Egypt. So they've built their foundation on Egypt. For you have made a lie our refuge, meaning that that is a lie and falsehood our hiding place. We think it's going to hide us away. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure what? foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic, right? I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge. What was hail but comes in a storm? The lie and water, the storm, the flood, will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death, meaning your agreement, you putting your foundation on the Egyptians will be annulled. Your agreement with the realm of the dead will not stand when the overwhelming scourge, again, a flood or the Assyrians, and they say sweets by, you will be beaten down by it. In this parable in Isaiah, he's talking about a building or a structure, a civilization that exists, the nation of Israel. You depend on Egypt to put your foundation there, but you're going to be destroyed. And sure enough, they were destroyed by the Assyrian army. And then, if would you go back one slide, Chris? And then he's talking about, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. That is in the future. And so the Jewish people read that and believed that there was going to be a cornerstone laid in the future. Now, come forward about 600, 650 years, there was uh, a group of Jewish people in... Uh, Qumran, maybe you've heard of that um, area, and they believe that the cornerstone was going to be when 12 men and three priests got together and led their area. That was the cornerstone. However, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, in the second temple, when Jesus was there, he was the, it was the second temple. The first had been destroyed by the Babylonians. This was the second temple. So the Ark of the Covenant was not there anymore, but where the Ark of the Covenant used to be, there was a stone raised up just a little bit and guess what it was called? The foundation or the cornerstone because their life surrounded that temple. And that's what their life surrounded. That's where they thought God dwelled. But then when Jesus is saying, if you come to me, hear my words, and you put them into practice, then I am the foundation or you can translate that the cornerstone. So Jesus is here laying claim to saying, that thing, that little thing in the temple is not the cornerstone. I am the foundation and the cornerstone. And if I live in you, then your body becomes the temple. This is quite a statement because all the Jewish people are waiting for the third temple to be built in Jerusalem. But the third temple has already been built and is continually being built. Its cornerstone is Jesus Christ. And the temple is here. Not just this building, but we are. The church of Jesus Christ is the third temple. And Jesus is the cornerstone of it all. And that's what he's saying in this parable. See, this is not just a simple children's parable, is it? No, it's saying that because what Jesus has done at this table... Because his body was broken for us, because his blood was shed for us, because he overcame sin and he overcame death by dying for us on the cross and being raised to life. That is what we lay our life upon. That is the cornerstone on Jesus himself. And he builds us up from the truth that is contained here at this table. We are the third temple people. And that's what Jesus is saying in this parable, along with other parts of how we live our Christian life. And it was on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed that he was at table with his disciples. And after having given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup saying, this 